in Mycological Society meeting and presentation. Um, first to start, I hope everybody is safe. I hope everybody's family is safe and doing as well as uh, expected in these strange times. But definitely glad that you can take the time out and uh, you know come to our meeting and to to hear our presenter. Um, let's see where will we start. Uh, also, hopefully you guys took advantage of the great weather that we've been having. Kind of unusual, the lack of rains, but. Uh, in order to get out, of the, out into the woods, see some new things, uh, see some new mushrooms, hopefully identify a few that, uh, that you weren't familiar with, went out so with socially distancing with friends. Um, so tonight, it's kind of going to be kind of short. We have a, uh, one announcement, and I'll just tell you kind of what the group is up to right now. Everything, of course, is on hiatus, and unfortunately, we won't be having our survivors banquet in January, but both Kim and I are thinking about trying to bring you guys something special that's culinary related. So, you know, we'll send that out in an email to the members and hopefully we'll come up with something pretty good. Um, Kristen is, is uh, here and she's going to be telling us about the election process. Of course, our elections are on for board members and, uh, and other positions on the board. So Kristen, you want to give us an update on that? Sure. Thanks, Kim. So just a brief update. So this year's election is taking place online. As many of you know, um, you should have received a ballot in your email. Um, uh, the voting period is November 4th through, so last Wednesday through this Wednesday, November 11th, um, and it closes at 11.59 p.m. on November 11th. So you have until then to cast your votes and um uh, so yes, yeah, so the ballot, it's an emailed ballot and there are descriptions of each of the candidates um, in the ballot. So you can click for more information on the ballot. And just to, just to let you know, if you don't have a Gmail account, there's a possibility that it ended up in your spam folder. So be sure to check your spam folder because <laughs> Kim said that it happened to her. So um, just check if you don't have a Gmail. It seems like there isn't an issue, you know, if you do have a Gmail account, it'll just be in your inbox. But otherwise, um, just make sure to take a peek in your spam folder. Um, and if for some reason um, it isn't there and you don't have a, a ballot, just reach out to me or um, Joe Cohen. <laughs> be fine. And we can arrange to um, get you a ballot. So... And that's it. Cast your votes. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. I appreciate all the work that you guys have been doing on that. Um, you know, again, we're a volunteer organization. And even though that we're online right now, we are always looking for volunteers. We have a lot of positions that are open. We have, like I said, new and exciting things coming down the line. Now that we know that we might be in this virtual situation for a little longer than we thought. So um, definitely, you know, we're going to be reaching out here pretty soon. We want to find out your strengths. We want to find out those that are interested and match them up because, you know, again, you see myself, you see Kristen, you don't see Candace behind the, the curtain here, but she's the, our, our guru that gets this up and running on YouTube. So um, thank you very much to her as well and everybody else working behind the scenes. Uh, I want to put a plug out for Nick and Maggie Iodanza. Uh, they always, they're the editors, and they get that newsletter out to you. And hopefully many of you have taken a look through that, read that, um, some great content in there. And also as well, please consider contributing to that, whether it be recipes, whether it be stories, tips or tricks, um, how to dry mushrooms. Uh, great photos are always welcome as well. So uh, if you have any questions, you can contact myself or Nick or Maggie Iodanza. Their, um, their number is in the newsletter itself. So definitely, please do that. Just a little housekeeping for tonight. Uh, obviously, all of you are watching on, on YouTube. So, you know, you please go ahead and you can put comments on the side. Uh, in order to do that, you have to be subscribed to the channel. So please log in. You have to use your Gmail account uh, to be able to do that. But please log in, and then you're able to put the comments on the side. 
And so tonight, what we'll be doing is, uh, if you have a question, definitely type that in. And if possible, could you put in hashtag question? Uh, so that can help me better visualize that and see that so that I can ask those questions to Patrick. Um, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to leave all the questions to the end, and then I'll be asking him. So definitely, put your questions in. You know, feel free to chat a little bit between each other, but please keep it kind of uh, brief so that we can actually look at the messages. Um, so tonight's topic is one that was uh, brought up a number of times by a number of our members who had a lot of questions about um, how fungi reproduce. And so uh, it's taken a while, but we have found someone who can definitely answer those questions. <laughs> so definitely looking forward to this talk. So Patrick is a mycologist documenting the mushrooms of, of the Chicago region with collections going to the Field Museum of Natural History. He teaches botany and mycology at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He assists on forays as a scientific advisor for the Illinois Mycological Association. And he started his mushroom activities with, with the Minnesota Mycological Society before moving to Chicago. Uh, he's also active in NAMA, which is the North American Mycological Association, and served as the voucher coordinator for 20 years. Uh, he has a great website, and I would say definitely take a look at that. And I'll put that in the live chat on the side, but that is www.mycoguide.com. That's mycoguide.com. And uh, one thing of interest, in 2016, um, he and a number of other individuals published a paper documenting a new chanterelle species, and this was dubbed the Chicago chanterelle, and this was confirmed by uh, DNA sequencing. Another little note of interest, and it's timely at this point, is I picked up this little game because I thought it would be funny, uh, pandemic. It turns out that uh, Patrick's nephew is the one who developed this, so it was <laughs> You never know the mycelial roots of fungal connections runs deep. So please welcome our speaker tonight, uh, Patrick Leacock. Thanks so much, Patrick. Uh, thanks, Kim. Um, my nephew published that pandemic game quite a while ago, more than 10 years ago. So it's getting a little bit of a revival um, this past year. Um, this talk I'm giving on fungal reproduction, I've been working on for about three years developing it. Um, it started back in 2017 um, at a bar. So um, when I was at the Field Museum, the, um, they decided to do a public event at a local bar and they had the slushies and science event where they had each scientist um, that wanted to volunteer have a table and talk about their um, reproduction in whatever organisms they studied, whether whatever kind of animal or plant or in my case fungi. So I, for that event, I put together this booklet on fungal reproduction and with um, a bunch of pages um, compiled from the internet of various aspects of fungal reproduction, diagrams and so forth, and to help people understand that. And the, um, the public was quite interested in that. Um, got a, little, a lot of good questions. Um, and then this topic has been developed further with um, my mycology class at the school and a few other presentations online. So I updated it this last couple of days. I've been adding to it this um, this fall with my mushroom class. So you're getting the latest and greatest of fungal sex as I understand it. Um, and I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see. Oops. I move this over here.
we compare fungi to plants and animals and other organisms, we see there's a difference in the body plan. So plants are kind of modular. They're made up of different parts, stems and roots and leaves and so forth. And there isn't any defined number of any of those parts. Trees have one main trunk and a bunch of roots and a bunch of leaves. Animals tend to have a body plan, uh, especially higher animals, a um, certain number of parts. Fungi are in a way modular, but they're quite simple. They're either single cells or they're made up of filaments and that's it. And any structures you see like a mushroom are actually made up of threads. They're not a true tissue like plants and animals. So there's a difference in um, growth forms for fungi. So one thing to remember is the main living part of the fungus is the hyphae or filaments, which we call the mycelium. That's the day-to-day -day part living in the soil or the log or attached to uh, tree roots or whatever they're living with. And the mushroom itself is the temporary reproductive structure. There's a few fungi like some polypores that have a perennial longer lived fruit body, but most mushrooms are, are temporary structures and their function is to make spores. And these spores are part of the sexual life cycle in the mushrooms. One of the simplest ways to reproduce for fungi is just fragmentation. Um, a few uh, lower animals can do this and plants can do this where part of the individual breaks off and can start growing separately from the, the main individual. And these would be considered clones. They're the same, um, same genetic makeup. They're just separated individuals that can grow now on their own. And this is what we use when we culture fungi. We take pieces of fungal tissue and plate them out or grow them up to make more and more individual fungi to um, grow for food or whatever purpose we're doing culturing the fungi. Um, there's two types of cell division or nuclear division, mitosis and meiosis. I don't know if you remember this from high school or wherever. And um, this is part of cell um, duplication or cell division. Mitosis is regular nuclear division where the, the daughter, the cells that um, end up being made by mitosis have the same genetic makeup, the same number of chromosomes as the original cell. So if you have a diploid cell, you're gonna end up with two diploid cells after mitosis and cell division. If you have one haploid cell, you end up with two haploid cells. So a cell is diploid or haploid depending on whether it has two sets of chromosomes or one set of chromosomes. So that'll, that is the main thing that comes into sexual reproduction, which is a switching back and forth between a diploid state and a haploid state. Um, and that allows us to get recombination of the chromosomes to get genetic variation. Meiosis is a reduction division where you go from a diploid cell usually to four haploid cells. So meiosis goes through two rounds of reduction or two rounds of division of the chromosomes. So in our case where we have 46 chromosomes with the diploid number two times 23 chromosomes, our um, sperm and egg cells have 23 or the, or the haploid number <coughs> of chromosomes. And to get there, you have um, regular duplication of the chromosomes like you do it with mitosis. But those um, chromosomes go through two cycles of separation to end up with just one set of chromosomes in each of the new uh, nuclei. So you go from diploid, two sets of chromosomes to haploid where you just have one set of chromosomes. And this occurs in all the eukaryotes that have any kind of sexual reproduction this change between diploid and haploid and back again to diploid. So if we compare animals, plants, and fungi again, um, animals typically have a sperm and egg for their sexual reproduction. The sperm brings the nucleus to the egg cell. Those two nuclei combine to make the new diploid um, cell that then goes on to become the embryo and the new animal, the new generation. Um, Plants have gametes, sperm and egg um, analogs, where the sperm moves from one flower to another flower, um, or in the case of mosses and ferns, swims through some water to get to where the egg is. Um, so the sperm moves to where the egg is, fertilizes the egg, and you get a zygote, and that zygote then grows into the new plant. 
but in, in plants, these um, haploid stages are multicellular. Um, they grow for a while before they actually make the, actually make the gametes, and they're, but they're hidden away inside of ovules and pollen. So we don't really think of them as having um, a multicellular um, haploid stage because we don't see it. It's inside of the flower parts. In fungi, they have all sorts of uh, reproductive strategies. And what you could call the gametes or the analogs for gametes could be um, zoospores. These are spores that swim in the lower fungi or uh, different kinds of um, spores produced by mushrooms and so forth. Or the mating is actually between hyphal structures in what we think of as regular mushrooms. And we'll be looking at that. So there's different ways that sexual reproduction is beneficial. This is, again, where you, you're switching between a diploid and haploid stages uh, by different methods. Um, you get through um, recombination and then meiosis again. You get um, chromosomes being brought together and then sorted out again separate, and that gives you um, new genetic combinations of those chromosomes. Um, when you have meiosis, you can get crossing over between the same chromosomes, so you get some mixing of genes that way. And this variation in offspring gives us, um, gives those organisms ways to adapt to changes in the environment um, over the long term. Um, there's also another advantage is um, some types of sexual reproduction, the way they um, do nuclear recombination and so forth is, uh, can be a way to get rid of um, harmful mutations or genetic mutations in genes. They can filter those out at some stage in the reproduction. So we're going to start with an animal life cycle to, just to get your bearing on these new charts that I've been making this past um, year on life cycles so that I have my own set of life cycle drawings for my website. So I have a generic animal here. That animal is diploid, just like we are. All the cells are um, diploid. They have two sets of chromosomes throughout the whole tissues and organs of the animal. Um, and then to get through sexual cycle, we need a haploid stage. So in this case with animals, we typically have sperm and egg. And these are single-celled structures that have one set of chromosomes, so they're called haploid. We, um, Label that as N, that means one set of chromosomes versus diploid with the two sets. And then to go between these two stages, right and left, haploid and diploid, we have two processes. We have fertilization, which is the union of the nuclei in two gametes to go from a haploid stage where we have two nuclei come together to make a diploid nucleus. And then to go back again to haploid from diploid, we have meiosis which is that reduction division that um, duplicates the DNA and then separates the chromosomes twice to end up with hap haploid nuclei that then go into making um, the sperm and egg cells. So if we add some arrows, this is what we get for an animal life cycle. We have the animal there in the lower right that's diploid. It has meiosis in its germ cells to make gametes, sperm or egg. Uh, meiosis makes four products. You have four nuclei here from each diploid cell that undergoes meiosis. Um, and those gametes are the only haploid stage, the only stage in the life cycle that has nuclei that, was, that just have one set of chromosomes. So then we have sperm and egg come together with fertilization to get back to the diploid side. And that first diploid cell is called the zygote. That's the product of fertilization, a single cell with a diploid nucleus. And then that grows through regular mitosis into the, the multicellular um, individual. So this is the animal life cycle. We call this diploid dominant because the, the right side, the diploid side, is what's dominant in the life of the animal or the individual. The, um, it lives most of its life as a diploid stage. In fungi, we have mitosis and meiosis, just the same as plants and animals and algae and everything else, <clears throat> except um, not bacteria. But um, regular mitosis in fungi allows the hyphae or whatever cell types to grow and produce more cells. That's regular standard mitosis to make the individual bigger. 
There are single-celled fungi, and some of those we call yeasts, like uh, the Saccharomyces, which is brewer's yeast or baker's or yeast for making bread or wine or beer or whatever. Uh, through fermentation, they make alcohol and carbon dioxide. And then um, mitosis in single-celled organisms is a form of asexual reproduction. So in yeasts, this is um, called budding, or some yeasts um, have fission instead of budding. So that's a way for a single-celled organism to go through mitosis just to make more individuals. And a lot of fungi have asexual reproduction, which is a simple way to make new individuals. So this is without sex. So it's a cheap and easy way to make new individuals just by asexual spores or conidia or whatever structures or fragmentation um, to make more and more copies of that individual. So there's no changes in the genotype unless there's a mutation along the way somewhere. So asexual reproduction is a, an easy way to reproduce, but there's no um, sexual recombination. Um, yeasts here have budding, so this is like Saccharomyces regular yeast. To make a new cell, it um, forms an outgrowth of the parent cell, and that, um, that second cell grows bigger and then um, buds off. The wall um, closes up between the two cells and it, and it separates. And then the interesting thing in these yeasts here is the uh, the budding leaves a scar on a cell wall. So you can tell how many times the cell budded by how many scars are on the outside wall. So this is regular budding where one cell um, grows out a new cell. The other option in some yeasts that are called fission yeasts is where the cell elongates and then makes a cross wall in the middle. So it's not really growing out a new little cell that gets bigger, but it's it's getting longer and then dividing itself in half. This is called a fission yeast. So let's, for our first fungus, let's build a life cycle for yeast because it's um, more simple than a mushroom life cycle. So to start, we're going to use a um, uh, the sexual cycle here, but everything is single cell. There's no multicellular organism or individual like we do in animals. Both sides of this life cycle are single cells. We have a single cell zygote or diploid cell. We have a single um, cells for the haploid side on the left. And to go from one side to the other, we can have haploid cells act like gametes and fuse together with, with mating or fertilization to go back over to the diploid side and that diploid cell at some point um, through environmental stress or whatever triggers it and go through meiosis to make four haploid cells. So we can alternate between the two sides. So this is called an alternation of generations. But in this case, both sides, uh, both generations are um, single cell or unicellular. So we take this regular cell uh, sexual reproduction and we add on asexual reproduction, which is just regular mitosis to make um, new cells. So this is where you have regular budding. So one cell buds to make another cell and you can keep doing this over and over and over, which is what happens when you're brewing beer in the big vat. The yeast is going crazy, just dividing and dividing through this asexual reproduction to make more and more individuals. But that can happen either with the haploid stage or the diploid stage. Either, either side of the, either generation can do this mitotic uh, reproduction. So we're going to add that to the sexual reproduction and we get this combined life cycle with the sexual cycle in the center. So that's the same as what we looked at before. And then it's got the asexual cycle added on to the left and onto the right. So we've got three cycles here that um, um, the two asexual cycles can reproduce the same individual. And the sexual cycle is to go between diploid and haploid and back again for um, genetic recombination and, and, um, and then separation again. So a lot of fungi are like this. They'll have a sexual cycle and various ways to have a unisexual uh, cycle. But in the case of this yeast, there's nothing that's multicellular. Everything is a single cell organism. So there's three main um, life cycle variation. I mean, there's lots of variations on a theme, but there's three, three main themes here with life cycles. There's the diploid dominant, like we saw in animals. 
um, some mushrooms or some fungi have this example, um, where most of the stage of the organism is diploid. Um, some fungi and some protozoa and algae have a haploid dominant, so it lives most of its life multicellular or single-celled as a haploid stage, and the diploid stage is only temporary stage to get through sex. Um, it's a temporary zygote. It might be a resting cell um, to get from um, between fertilization back to meiosis again. And then plants and some algae and some fungi have this alternation of generations where both stages can live for quite a while. Um, they can live separately or they can live together. In some cases in plants, one of, these, one of the generations is dependent on the other generation for nutrition. Um, fungi, it's typically, um, they live separately, like the yeast in the yeast. And then there's a lot of fungi that have asexual reproduction without any known or rare cases of uh, sexual reproduction. So some, some molds and so forth have seem to be missing a sexual stage, but as we do more and more investigation, sometimes we do discover a sexual stage. So we're not quite sure um, in all cases. Um, one thing that's added in here is that dipherion. So on the right, upper right there, you can see the diploid, a diploid individual, and then there's that N plus N. That symbolizes a dicarion where you have two sets of chromosomes, but the nuclei are separate. So that cell, that dicarion cell, has two sets of chromosomes, and there's in separate nuclei, unlike diploids where the two sets are in the same nucleus. And once they're in the same nucleus, they can't separate again until you go through meiosis. And this dicarion stage in fungi, the mushrooms and cup fungi, gives them a lot of options on what to do those, with those nuclei. They have more mating options than if they were diploid because those nuclei are separate and they can decide to donate a nucleus to another individual for um, mating um, options. So we're gonna look at um, these other life cycles here for a while, but here's just to clarify the dicarion is different from diploid and haploid so the dicarion, the nuclei are haploid, but you have two different nuclei in the same cell. And those two nuclei come from the two individuals that made it, that came together to make that new generation that has two sets of chromosomes, but in separate nuclei. So this has been called living apart together and gives them options on what to do with those nuclei. So here's the animal life cycle we saw. The diploid generation on the right is dominant, and the haploid side on the left is only the gametes. Here's the opposite with haploid dominant, um, where the haploid stage on the left is the dominant stage, and the zygote on the right, the diploid stage, is just a temporary um, cell. It may be, um, may be a resting stage, so it may live for a while, but it's a resting stage. Um, to enable the organism to go through fertilization back through meiosis again to get some genetic recombination. But the organism uh, lives most of its life as haploid. And if we have those two together, like in plants, then we have what's called an alternation of generations. Part of the plant lives as a haploid individual and part of it lives as diploid. Um, seed plants and uh, ferns, uh, larger plants that we're familiar with have um, the plant that we see is diploid and the haploid part is reduced down to a very tiny little plant or in the cases of um, seed plants but buried inside of the, the cone or the flower of those um, of the flowering plants or the conifers. In the case of mosses though, mosses and liverworts, they live most of their life on the left side as haploids so that green moss and the green liverwort are all haploid, and the sporophyte or the diploid side is a temporary structure that is has a spore capsule to make spores. Um, so the dominant part for a moss and liverwort is the haploid side, but it does go through a multicellular diploid side to make the spore capsule. So um, fungi 
Uh, lots, there's lots of different lineages of fungi, but you can kind of group them together into five main categories. So what used to be called the lower fungi, but um, they're not any less evolved, are the, the chytrids, the zygomycetes, and the glomeromycetes. Um, they have variations on their life cycles, and we'll look at those at the end. Um, first, we'll look at the basidiomycetes and then the astomycetes. Most of the mushrooms we're familiar with are in the basidiomycetes. Some of them, like cup fungi and morels, are down in the astomycetes. Both of these divisions are in a larger group called the dicaria, which refers to that dicarion stage, the haploid plus haploid nuclei in the same cell. So this dicarion type life cycle is only in the basidios and the ascos. It's only in these two groups of fungi. Plants and animals don't have this option of, of having two nuclei in the same cell from different parents, as far as I know. So mushroom spores are mostly very small. Um, the regular mushrooms we know about are on the order of five to 15 micrometers. A micrometer is a one thousandth of a millimeter, so they're really tiny. So this drawing shows mushroom spores or other various kinds of fungal spores compared to the smallest plant seed, um, this orchid seed, which is <coughs> maybe a couple or 300 micrometers long. But if you look on the left, that in the middle on the left, there's glomer mycota. They have actually really big spores that are 40 to 800 micrometers. So the, some of those spores would be bigger than orchid seeds. And they're actually visible um, if you look at soil samples. But most um, fungal spores are very tiny and you need to, a microscope to study them. Um, various molds and some fungi make a lot of asexual spores as their main reproductive uh, method. And you can find molds in your house if you leave food out too long or you put out an auger plate with some um, sugar in the medium or whatever you can get molds to grow on uh, various food sources. And these could be blue or black or other colors. The penicillium is a blue mold. Aspergillus um, is one of the darker black molds. And um, these molds have various asexual spores that are called um, canidia. They're um, little cells that bud off of these little branches to make lots and lots of these um, little canidospores that then bud off and get spread around in the, in the air or by insects or whatever. So molds um, do most of the reproduction asexually through these um, canidiospores. Uh, so the most of the mushrooms we know about are in the basidiomycota. And these mushrooms, uh, as you remember, are just the temporary reproductive structure. And their, their main purpose is to make spores. There's a few accessory purposes that people theorize about, such as um, dumping waste products up into the mushroom if they want to get it out of, the, of, out of their hyphae. Um, so um, there's been discussion on that with mushrooms concentrating heavy metals and so forth. Um, they, get, they pump that stuff up into the mushroom to get rid of it. <coughs> One thing that's unique to the basidiomycetes is this odd structure called the clamp connection. It looks like a little clamp or bump on the hypha. And this is thought to help with nuclear division. So these basidiomycetes have hyphae that are dicarion. So we've got two different nuclei in each cell. And most of these uh, fungi have synchronized division of the nuclei when it decides to make a new cross wall to separate these growing cells. So that the cells only grow at the tip. So this, this filament gets longer and longer. And then at some point, um, it makes a cross wall. And before it makes a cross wall, the nuclei divide at the same time. And this clamp is thought to help separate the, the two nuclei when they divide so that the nuclei don't get tangled up together. The, the um, microtubules in that whole apparatus for nuclear division doesn't get tangled up. So there's a little branch that forms, um, heads toward the back, called a hook. And one nucleus divides into that hook, and the other nucleus divides along the main branch. 
And then after division, that little hook gets walled off and then the main branch gets walled off. And then that hook continues growing at the tip and fuses with the cell in the back and that um, nucleus in the hook um, moves down into the back cell. And that's how you end up with two cells with two nuclei in each, where you start out with <clears throat> one cell with the two nuclei. Um, some hyphae, some species of fungi have more than one clamp at each cross wall or septum. Um, some fungi don't have clamps on all their hyphae. Um, so it was one of the identification features under the microscope. You look to see if it has clamps or not. That helps separate some different groups of mushrooms sometimes. So mushrooms are making spores and those spores are made on some kind of surface and that surface or fertile layer is called the hymenium. Um, it's the tissue layer that's making the spores um, that's exposed to the air. So that's on the gills or inside the tubes of a bolete or on the outer surface of a coral or club mushroom <clears throat> or on the sides of the tooth of a, any teeth or spine fungi. And it's also coating that underside of a crust um, or any other kind of fungus that has a part that's exposed to the air is where the spores are being made. Puffballs and so forth, stink horns and puffballs and birds nests, those produce their spores on the inside. Also truffles and false truffles make their spores on the inside and then those get released when the uh, puffball breaks open or the, um, the truffle gets opened up by um, getting eaten or for some reason. So basidiomycetes make a basidium. That's why they're called basidiomycetes. And a basidium is the sexual, the sexual cell that makes the spores. And a basidium makes the spores on the outside. And most of the mushrooms we're familiar with makes four spores. Um, some of the um, gastromycetes like pisolithus, the, the um, Dyer's puffball has eight spores. Um, some chanterelles have four, five, or six spores. So some of the groups have variable number of spores, but most mushrooms have uh, four spores. Uh, a few of these have two spores, like a certain ammonite or a certain lactaria might have just two spores. But those spores are made on the outside, and the spores themselves have lots of different shapes and sizes and ornamentation features that you can look at under the microscope. This is a drawing I like of the basidium development. So on the left, we have a hypha with clamps and it makes a new um, terminal cell there that is gonna develop into the basidium, the cell that's gonna make spores. So at that stage, it's called a probasidium. And then um, it's got the two nuclei that are separate. And then at number three, at th number three, we have um, karyogamy, where the two nuclei fuse together. And then at number four, we have meiosis, where the, uh, we have the reduction division, so we end up with four nuclei that are all haploid. And then the basidium um, keeps growing and makes spores, and those nuclei migrate up into the spores through the strigma, strigmata the, at number six there. And number five is the vacuole. It's a water vacuole that uh, fills up and helps push the cytoplasm and the nuclei up into the spores. There's a um, very interesting, somewhat mysterious method for what's called ballistospory, where the spores are shot off of the basidium. So the spores are attached on the strigma, and the spore has a little um, bump at the base called a hyalur appendix. Um, that's part of the spore. And that forms what's called a bowler's trough. It's a liquid drop that only recently they figured out was made up of water. They weren't sure before. Um, and it seems to be secreted by the spore. There's also this adaxial drop that's on the side of the spore, which is spread out along the um, side of the spore. And some spores that you look at that have ornamentation like Russellacterius, they have an area there on the spore that's fairly flat where this, this adaxial drop is formed. There's not as much ornamentation there. So that's to help 
uh, drop formation. Um, those two drops get bigger and bigger until they fuse or meet each other and then form one big droplet. And that um, fusion of these two droplets is thought to um, change the center of gravity for the, the spore plus the water. And it breaks the spore off of the strigma. And then that spore that's broken off gets shot off a short ways away from the gill into the space between the two gills or into the space in the center of the pore or whatever the kind of structure it has. And then the spore falls down from that. But um, the method for this shooting the spore isn't quite understood. And there's a couple theories that may work together. One idea is when the gravity, center of gravity changes, it's enough to move the spore away from the gill. But um, part of the theory that I think um, adds more to the equation is um, when the mushroom is attached to the ground or the log or whatever, it has a negative charge because the ground has a negative charge. So that negative charge would go up through the mushroom into the gills and to the spores that are attached to the basidia. So the whole mushroom and the spores and everything have a negative charge. And when that spore breaks off, you have a basidium and stock, strigma stock there with a negative charge, and you have a spore with a negative charge. So right when that breaks, you have um, the negative charges repel each other and push the spore uh, very fast away from the gill, just enough space to have them, um, the spore can then fall down um, and not get stuck on the gill. So that's, um, it's still debated what is the primary force for spore um, discharge. Um, most basidia in the regular mushrooms don't have any cross walls in there, but some of the types in the jelly fungi have cross walls. The tree ear there um, on the left has um, cross walls that are horizontal in auricularia, and each little cell segment of the basidium makes a spore. In tremella and these other jellies in the middle there, the Cross walls are vertical, and each cell again makes a uh, spore. Dacrymyces has this what's called a tuning fork basidium with two <coughs> two long strigma, two long strigma that each make a spore. Um, and the drawing on the right shows a jelly fungus with these hyphal threads, um, and the basidia are down um, at the bottom of that drawing, and they have very long strigma strigma. They go up through the jelly to the surface of the jelly so that the spores are made up, up in the air outside of the jelly layer. So the basidia are down embedded in the gel and the spores are made in the air at the tips of the strigmata that stick out into the air. These spores are, I think, are usually white. Um, I don't know, probably possible to get a spore print, I'm not sure. So let's start building a mushroom life cycle. We're gonna start with this haploid dominant stage, um, but we're gonna change two things. We're not gonna have single celled gametes. We're gonna get rid of the gametes there in the top left. No to gametes. We don't have single cells. We don't have sperm and egg here acting as gametes. And then the fertilization stage where the two, the two haploid cells come together and fuse, and then the nuclei fuse. We're going to split that into two steps that are separate in time. So the fertilization that occurs normally in animals and plants, in some fungi like mushrooms, that fertilization stage is split into two different stages. And there's can be a few days or a few weeks or a few months or several hundred years in between these two stages. <coughs> so here's our new life cycle for um, the dicaria, the basidiomyces and the ascomyces. So on the left, we have a haploid generation that can be multicellular. So you have a haploid individual that finds another compatible haploid individual there in the top left. And then instead of fertilization, we have plasmogamy and karyogamy. Those are the two steps of what we usually call fertilization. So these two individuals mate through plasmogamy. So 
So the cells fuse, but the nuclei do not fuse. So that's why it's called plasma, plasma gamma, because the cytoplasm fuses. Um, and then um, that fuse cell can draw my mitosis into our regular dicterion individual, which is unique to the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes. And in the case of mushrooms, like ammonita mushrooms and chanterelles and so forth, that is the regular stage that lives a long time in the soil or in the log or wherever it's growing as a bacterium. So it's multicellular and each, each um, cell has two nuclei. Each nucleus is from one of the two parent individuals that fuse together. At some point that um, bacterion individual is going to go through the rest of the sexual life cycle and typically makes a mushroom <coughs> to make um, the, the basidia or the acide, or the sexual cells. And that's where we get karyogamy to make a diploid nucleus. And then that diploid nucleus divides by meiosis to make the haploid spores. So this karyogamy and meiosis occurs only in the sexual cell um, right when, before it makes spores. So that's a very short-lived stage uh, for, for the diploid stage. So the long living part of this life cycle is either the dicarion, for most of the mushrooms we're familiar with, the top left, the top right part, or in um, some other fungi, ascomycetes and so forth. The long lived stage might be the haploid stage on the left. But for regular basidiomycete mushrooms, it's, it's the um, long lived stages that they carry on on the right. So if we take that life cycle and put it in a box on the bottom right and then add other stuff, then we get a more complicated system here. So this is Copernopsis cinerea. It's one of the little inky cap mushrooms that's used for um, reproductive studies. It's very easy to grow and have it perform all its different um, stages of reproduction in the lab. Um, so it has a regular life cycle like other mushrooms that's in that box, what we just talked about. But it has asexual stages of three different types. The dicarian stage can make chlamydospores. These are thick-walled resting spores um, just made by mitosis. So part of the hypha uh, swells up and makes a thick wall and um, separates itself into a resting spore. And then um, some other fungi can make chlamydospores in different parts of the um, individual. There's another type of resting stage called a sclerotium. This is also what's made with morels, where you have a bunch of hyphae that kind of tangle up into a storage structure that has thicker walls and that can overwinter or whatever. The haploid stage on the left can also make sclerotia and chlamydospores um, but in this case, they're haploid. And it also can make oidia, which are basically like the canidia spores in a mold, where they're just a, just a stalk that's budding um, and making little, little um, single spore, little single spores or spore analogs that are asexual. And these are called oidia, um, pretty much the same as can, um, canidia spores. So this gives it a lot more options to reproduce sexually or asexually, depending on the environmental condition. So the thing I've been developing the last couple of months are these um, handouts that will go on my website um, this winter sometime. So if you're interested in these, um, check my website later or send me an email if you want. <coughs> these aren't quite done yet, but there's um, couple different puzzles for putting together uh, mushroom life cycles. And there's also um, variations on the regular mushroom life cycle for other types of mushrooms, uh, for basidiomycete mushrooms. So this is my main puzzle that I have, um, the more challenging version with all the parts separate. So what you do is you take this, print it out, and then cut up all, all the little rectangles, and then you piece it together into a life cycle. So we're gonna do that here. For you. 
So we're going to start with the spores in the top center. Um, we're, for this life cycle, we're using an Amanita or Lecuria or Cortinarius flamulonin and Hebloma type example. And in that type of uh, life cycle or variation, the spores actually have two nuclei. So it's called binucleate. There's two, there's two nuclei in the spore, but the nuclei are the same. They're the same mating type. So that's called a homokaryon. Homokaryon means the same nucleus. So both nuclei are the same. Just happens to have two nuclei in there. That spore germinates when it lands on a suitable location and grows by mitosis into a new haploid individual that's multicellular. Um, and you can call this a monokaryon because it has one nucleus in each cell, or you can call it a homokaryon, which means all the nuclei there are the same. This haploid individual can live for any whatever length of time it can survive before it mates. And um, but at some point, um, it'll mate with another haploid um, or other individual that can donate a nucleus to this individual. So in the center there, we have a different haploid individual that has a different mating type. So we've got purple circles there instead of orange um, for a color difference there. Then these two individuals are going to mate. And we got some more detail here. Um, and these two individuals, the hyphae grow together and fuse through that plasmogamy where the the cells fuse and the cytoplasm mixes, but the nuclei do not come together. So on the right there, we have the two haploid hyphae growing um, closer and closer to each other. Um, I used to think that pheromones were involved like some other organisms where the pheromones are released to the outside, but apparently the pheromones that are produced are inside the cells and not active, as I thought, outside the cells. So these cells have to grow together before they figure out whether they're compatible or not. And that we have that in the lower left, where the two uh, the two hypo tips have fused, and that new cell that's joined by plasmogamy has the two um, nuclei there in the same cell with the two different mating types. So that's our first dicaryon cell. Now the really cool thing that happens next is that um, in this case, that purple nucleus that's donated <coughs> to this dicaryon, that starts dividing and migrating through the existing hyphae of the um, other individual. So that's shown in the lower right there where the purple nucleus has divided and migrated throughout all the cells um, to make a dicaryon condition in all the cells of that haploid. So we get rid of the haploid individual, and it all, all of it becomes a dicaryon, um, however far that nucleus can travel um, up and down the making. And the little cross walls dissolve enough or um, open up enough for the nucleus to migrate through. And once the uh, new nucleus gets to a hypal tip there in the bottom center, then you get new tip growth. And then in this case here, you can see we've got clamp, a new clamp formation there as it's making new spores, uh, new cells. So this dicarion then grows at the tips um, and uh, generates new cells, new hypothreads as a dicarion. So that happens. And then we have, so that's where we are here so far. And then at the lower, the lower right, that new dicarion grows through mitosis to get bigger and bigger and bigger and make a mycelium that's um, dicarion. Have two sets of chromosomes in the two separate nuclei. And that mycelium for mushrooms like chanterelles or whatever can live a long time, many years. And that's the main life stage of the fungus is this mated individual that has this dicarian condition where it's got two sets of uh, nuclei in each uh, cell. At some point when there's uh, environmental triggers or seasonal change or whatever, it's gonna make a mushroom so then we add that on here on the bottom uh, bottom right. We've got that mycelium um, grows a little pinhead called a primordium. These are tiny little pinheads um, down 
at the surface of the soil or the surface of the log. Um, and those little pinheads are made. It's like a really mi microscopic little mushroom. Um, and that waits, that's made in advance. And then it waits for the right conditions, usually some good rainfall. And that grows by mitosis then with the rain into the mushroom. So in this case, the mushroom is all dicarion. All the hyphae making up the stem and the cap and the gills and everything is all dicarion. Every cell in that mushroom has the two sets of chromosomes in the cells. This is not the same as with cup fungi and morels. They do something differently, which is even more strange. I'll we'll get to that in a minute. So that mushroom has um, gills. And on the gills, it's making the basidia. And on the bottom left there, we have a probasidium, which is the, the, um, the new little basidium before we have nuclear fusion. So then we're going to go through the different stages we saw for the basidium development. So the first step is karyogamy, where those two nuclei come together and make a diploid nucleus, which you could call the, the zygote, if you want. That's diploid. The two sets of chromosomes are in the same nucleus. And then that's followed um, by meiosis. So karyogamy there is the second stage of fertilization, which was started on the right by plasmogamy. So you can see there's a big gap between plasmogamy and karyogamy, whereas in animals and plants, those two stages happen right after each other. There's no delay. Uh, so we have the basidium goes through meiosis to make the four nuclei. And those four nuclei migrate, move up into the new spores on the top left. So then we have spores with nu one nucleus in each spore. And you might think we're ready to go. And in some cases, for some mushrooms, that's the case. But in a lot of mushrooms, we have another nuclear division. And this is just regular mitosis. And this mitosis happens after meiosis. It's an extra division after meiosis, so it's called a post-meiotic mitosis. So if you ever see that phrase, post-meiotic mitosis, that's a mitotic division after meiosis. And so that takes you from four nuclei to eight nuclei. And in this case, in our example here, that mitosis happens in the spores. So that's how each spore ends up with two nuclei in there. And then those spores are shot off, and we're back to where we started with a spore with um, two nuclei of the same type in the same spore. So the other um, parts of this puzzle have variations on here where you can substitute um, different things, like armillaria mushrooms are the one of the odd cases where the mycelium is actually diploid. So when we have um, mating, we do go through plasmogamy and periogamy at the same time, so we end up with diploid hyphae. Um, like we do with plants and animals. But there's other variation, variations on, on this that would be in those other puzzle pieces. This is something else I put together. I didn't, I wasn't able to find a chart that showed the different variations on this nuclear division and migration in the basidium. So um, there's several papers that um, go over this on all the different types. There's six different types here. Um, but I put it into a chart. This will also be on the website um, when I get the life cycle stuff up there. The top left shows the regular basidium development past the stage of meiosis where you get four nuclei. Um, and then after that, there's six, six different variations on what happens with those nuclei in the spores. So the simplest version is the pattern E that's on the bottom left. That's where the nuclei migrate into the spores, and there's no second mitosis. There's no mitosis after meiosis. So in a regular agaricus mushroom, you get one nucleus in each spore. So the neat variation or the neat trick for agaricus bisporus, the commercial mushroom, is that that is uh, two spores. It only makes two spores usually. And because those nuclei divide before they go into the spores, um, because meiosis happens before the nuclei go into the spores, you end up with 
um, two nuclei in each spore, but uh, they're compatible nuclei of the two different mating types. So these spores start out as dicarion spores, basically, and they can germinate directly into a dicarion. You don't need any mating from these spores. So that's an interesting variation for agaricus by spores. Um, but there are variations on, on how many basidia are of this type and how many, there's two other ways they can make um, other, two other nuclear patterns they can do in their spores to get variations on that idea. Um, in the middle, we have three different ways the um, mitosis after meiosis can occur in the top center. That mitosis can happen in the basidium. We get eight nuclei in the basidium. In the middle there, we can get mitosis in the stigmata. So the nuclei migrate partway, halfway to the spores, and they divide in the stigmata. So we have eight spores. Um, two of each type in each of the stigmata. And the other option is the nuclei migrate in the spores and then they divide. So we end up in the bottom center there with two nuclei in each spore that are of the same type. And if you have a two spored mushroom like a lacaria, you end up with four spores because two spore, two nuclei of the same type move into a spore and then divide, and then you end up with four of each um, in each of those two spores. And then on the right is the variations of what happens with the nuclei after that. So in the top center, there's two patterns on what happens with those eight nuclei. In the top right, pattern F, all, all the nuclei can go into the spores, and we end up with two nuclei in each spore of the same type in each. Pattern A is where only four of the nuclei go in, or basically one nucleus goes into each spore. All the extra nuclei stay behind in the basidium and they, they degenerate, they don't um, do anything. Um, pattern B is where um, the nuclei divide in the sterigmata and then one goes into the spore and one goes back to the basidium. So we end up with spores that have one nucleus and four extra nuclei in the basidium that just generate. And then if you have, new, if you have that mitosis in the spore where each spore has two nuclei, in pattern C, one, one nucleus from each spore goes back into the basidium and generates, whereas in pattern D, <clears throat> which is what we showed for amnida and lacaria and so forth, those two nuclei stay in the spores. There's no back migration of the nuclei. So there's, these are the six different patterns that we know about for nuclear behavior when we make spores in mushrooms. But it's very hard to figure out which mushroom does which type because um, there's a lot of microscopic and staining and um, even DNA labeling and so forth to figure this out because you have to figure out where the different mating types end up. <coughs> One of the options we have with this dicarion situation is that our, lo our lonely haploid there on the top right that wants to mate, it can mate with a dicarion. These are called uh, one, uh, at least one source calls this an unholy marriage, where it's a dicarion mating with a haploid individual. And in this case, that uh, dicarion on the top left donates a nucleus to the haploid individual. That nucleus then uh, propagates through the haploid to make turn it into a dicarion. Um, this is called a dicarion monocarion mating or a dimon mating. And um, it's interesting, we don't know how how common this is in the wild though. We can see it happen in the lab. There's lots of other um, variations on these dicarions and what they do with the nuclei and so forth. Our malaria has diploid hyphae and they can exchange um, genetic material between diploid and haploid mycelia. So people are studying that. There's also people, a lot of people studying um, heterobasidion because that has a lot of wacky things it does. Um, it can have, it's a dicarion, but it can have multiple nuclei. It can have, um, instead of just two nuclei, it can have six or eight or whatever nuclei in each cell. And those nuclei do not divide synchronously. So you can end up with cells that have more one nucleus than the other type. And if that nuclear division gets out of hand, 
and it's not synchronous, you can end up with a cell that only has one nucleus of one mating type, and then that cell goes on to divide and divide and divide, makes uh, more of a mycelium, and that's called a sector that's um, monokaryon. <coughs> so it can separate out and make a monokaryon out of a dikaryon. <coughs> So lots of different variations on the theme here with these dicaria, mycelia. Um, parasexual cycle is another really strange thing that happens um, for um, haploids to get together and fuse nuclei and you get a diploid nucleus, but you don't get my you don't get meiosis to do reduction division to go back to haploid again. Instead, that diploid nucleus goes through several, several uh, mitotic divisions and um, over time, extra chromosomes get um, left out of the new cells. So you end up with a haploid nucleus again with a certain combination of chromosomes. Um, so there, there's, people are starting to figure out how, those, what, how this process selects for certain chromosomes out of the two um, mated individuals. But I don't pretend to understand how that works. Um, rust fungi are a whole, whole other topic. They are basidiomycetes and they have um, lots of different stages in their life cycle. They can have up to five different spore stages. Um, this is an example of a um, well-studied wheat rust. So on the bottom side, the lower side there is the life cycle on the wheat plant and it's got different spore stages for to infect more wheat plants and then a resting overwintering stage there on the left, the teleospores, where it overwinter and goes through sex, meiosis, and so forth to make basidiospores. Those spores then land on the barberry shrub on the top part, and that goes through the other part of the life cycle on the barberry, and that's where mating occurs on the barberry to go from haploid to the dicarion, and then the dicarion makes spores to get over to the wheat plant. So this is a really complicated um, cycle. A, a lot of rusts have two different host plants like this. Some of them just have one host plant. Um, and usually the host plants are not even related to each other. Um, and some of the some of the rust, like coffee rust, we don't know the other host plant. Um, we haven't figured out what it is. Um, different variation on a theme here with spore product for spore release is bird's nest fungi. So they're in the gastromycete type group where the spores are made on the inside of these little packets that, like, that look like eggs in a cup. The raindrops splash off these packets of spores. The packet goes through the air and lands on a plant some way away from the cup. And that packet dries out and then releases the deciduospores on the inside. So this is a two-stage launching process to get the um, spores, the little packet of spores away from the cup and then um, have those spores um, hopefully higher up off the ground on a plant for the spores that come out of the little dried up packet to get into the air. Now we're going to look at ascomycetes. So these include the cup fungi, the morels, false morels, those sorts of things, and a lot of the molds, and also the carbon fungi like on dead man's fingers and all that sovereomycete group um, and some other groups of um, ascomycetes. So they have a, their reproductive cell is an ascus, which is a, also called a sac. So these can sometimes be called sac fungi. Uh, but they're ascomycetes named after the ascus. And that sexual cell has meiosis. It has karyogamy and meiosis like, um, like a basidium, but the spores are made on the inside. So on the top left there, we have <coughs> a diploid nucleus that divides by meiosis to make four nuclei, then we usually get mitosis again and end up with eight nuclei. And then those eight nuclei get packaged up into eight spores. That's the typical pattern in um, a lot of the common cup fungi. So on the bottom left there is a microscope view with the spore stain. The young spores are red and the mature spores are dark colored. And there's eight spores in each of these ascus sacs, and those will get shot out into the air. And usually these um, assi, this layer is 
pointing up so that the spores are shot up into the air <coughs> out of the cup. Some of the spore carps or fruit bodies of these cup fungi might be closed up um, in some of the other types, like in dead man's fingers and so forth. So this is our regular dicarian life cycle, and we're going to adjust it for these cup fungi and morels. So what we're going to do is um, the long-lived stage of the cup fungus or morel is the haploid individual on the left. The dicarion is a brief stage. The dicarion on the top right is a brief stage that only exists in the actual fruit body, the cup or the morel. Um, the long-lived stage is haploid. So these cup fungi, if you think of your scarlet cup that's on the log, it's out living year to year in the log as a haploid. And then in the spring or whenever, it gets together with another haploid individual, and they grow together to make the cup. And that cup is made up of hyphae from the two individuals. And somewhere in that face of the cup, the hyphae fuse. And you get a dicarion. The dicarion hyphae then grow up to make the, the sexual cells, the assa in the hymenium. So this cup fungus in the morel is actually made up of three different kinds of hyphae. The two individual haploids and then the mated dicarion. So in the mushroom, the regular mushroom like a chanterelle or ammonita, all the hyphae in the mushroom are the dicarion. There's no haploid mycelium in there. That's way in the past. But in the ascomycetes here, these cup fungi, that um, the two individuals come together um, and then mate inside of that cup to make the dicarion that is only made there to make the um, ascos ascospores, the acai and the ascospores. And inside the ascus, we have the karyogamy and the meiosis. So we have the bottom part of the life cycle there, like we do with the seeds, where we, the nuclei come together um, and then divide again to get the spores. So the weird thing about cup fungi that um, it's pretty weird when I first learned about it was this cup is made up of both individuals that are haploid. So we got the pink, the pink strain and the blue strain growing together to make that form that whole cup structure. In some cases, including morels, that structure might just be one of the individuals. And the other individual fertilizes, um, they fertilize, and then um, you get the dicarion, which is the dark purple there. And th those hyphae grow up through the cup to make the, the ascite. Each ascus then makes the spores inside. <coughs> On the right, it shows how that blue individual is donating nuclei to the pink individual through the cells where they fuse. And then that pink individual, the dicarion hyphae, the purple hyphae, grow up out of that. And those grow up through the cup um, or in the pits of the morel to um, end up making spores. The uh, morel life cycle is basically a cup fungus life cycle with a bunch of stuff added on. We've got sclerotia added on as an overwintering stage, which is important if you want to make morels, if you're growing morels, you have to get it through the sclerotium stage and then you have to trigger it to make the morel mushrooms. There's also some other asexual spores in there um, in the lower part and on the right to reproduce the, um, the uh, haploid individual. The interesting thing is there's a, a recent study, a paper on um, this looked at reproduction in 14 species of morels, and they found out that sometimes instead of both individuals making that morel structure, there's just one individual making the morel structure, and the other individual fertilizes it, and um, then the dicarion grows up to end up making spores. But there's they found a few cases where that the one haploid individual made a morel and there wasn't any mating. So we got a whole morel formed, but it was sterile because there's no other individual to mate with. So there's no spore production. So that's pretty weird to go to the bother of making a whole morel structure without before you have even mated. Um, um, I'm not going to talk about lichens much. This is a life cycle I'm still working on, but a lichen is a fungus living together with an alga. So that's in the upper right, upper left there. And 
the fungus and algae are living together. The, the lichen thallus can reproduce itself through vegetative means. There's different structures that do that. Um, lichenization to form the thallus is an alga and fungus coming together. Um, and this, this is a ascomycete lichen, so um, everything's haploid here. You can get um, reproductive and mating and the sexual life cycle on the lower right there. Um, so it's thought that you can get spermatia, which is a like a fertilizing agent from another um, thallus of a different mating type and go through that. So lots of things going on here, lots of variation. But the fungus part usually um, typically needs the algae to grow, whereas the algae typically can live on their own or inside of the fungus to make a lichen. So now we're going to briefly look at these other little three groups of um, non-mushroom uh, fungi, the chytrids, cygos, and the glomeromycota. Um, chytrids are um, typically microscopic. Um, they're either single-celled or they're filamentous, often aquatic. Some of these are plant parasites. Um, there's one that's the parasite on the frogs. Um, the single-celled chytrids have little uh, rhizoids that anchored on its food. Um, the top center is a pollen grain, so that we have a chytrid fungus eating the pollen grain. And on the right, we've got a chytrid eating um, an alga cell. The um, chytrid on the frog um, is diploid and asexual as far as they know, um, which is different than, um, you know, mushrooms. It's, it lives as diploid. So this life cycle is uh, well, it doesn't li match up with animals because there's no sexual part to this life cycle that they know of. But everything's diploid, and that's what it got. It has a stage where it makes zoospores. Zoospores are basically spores that are modal, and they swim around through the water to uh, infect another frog. They're, the most complicated chytrid is a Alamyces, and these can go, be grown in the lab. They're usually grown in the lab for like college classes. Um, and they have two different life stages that live separately. The haploid stage and diploid stage live separate. Each side makes spores to um, produce the other stage in the life cycle. Zygomycetes are haploid dominant. So it, it lives like a mold most of its life um, as haploid. And then if it goes through sexual stage, finds a compatible um, partner, the two hyphae fuse um, in the lower right there to make a big zygosprange in this multicellular, and that's a resting stage with a, with a very thick wall. And that um, later will germinate and grow um, sprangia structures to um, have meiosis um, make spores to get back to the haploid side of the equation. The glomeromycota are probably the most cryptic. Uh, in terms of reproduction, we don't know what they're doing. Um, they make big spores in the soil, but those spores have many, many nuclei. And if you do DNA studies, those nuclei are many different genotypes. There's not just one or two genotypes in there. So a lot of um, different genotypes in there. Um, they found that they um, do have the genes necessary to, to have meiosis, but uh, people don't know if meiosis occurs or where it does in the life cycle. There's no evidence. We can't see any physical evidence for that. Um, and these are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that live in most um, in roots of most plants. They're the most common mycorrhizal type of, of plants. And then here we end up with um, slime molds, which are not true fungi. They're relatives of uh, animals and fungi in the um, amoebozoa group. Um, they have an alternation life cycle where part of it is haploid and part is diploid. The diploid side here is longer lived. That's the slime part that's living in the soil or the log um, eating bacteria. And then at some point um, it makes those little reproductive structures that we usually see where it's making spores after meiosis. And that goes, that gives us over to a um, um, little single cell um, cycle form that then mates to make a um, diploid stage again. So now we're going to have questions. Um, so we're going to have Kim help me with the questions.
All right, we're back. Take that up there. All right, we're back. Well, um, I've got to say, I have a background in biology, and it's been a long time <laughs> since I have I have heard those things. So, okay, um, yeah. Right, so take it easy on us with the questions here. Um, so Peter is asking a question. He says, "What is the range in chromosome number?" And among mushrooms uh, we're familiar with, and in the range in DNA base pair numbers relative to humans. So um, I have, so I don't have that in this talk. I have that for my class. I have that in a different talk um, that's relating to the tree of life and how fungi compare to animals and plants and all that. So that genome sizes and stuff are in there. And um, the weird thing was fungi is it's extremely hard to figure out how many chromosomes there are because the chromosomes don't condense like they do in plants and animals. So if you think of the typical slide you had in lab where you look in the slide and you can see all the little chromosomes in the plant, like the onion root tip, the stain, you can see the different chromosomes line up there. Fungi, the chromosomes are just a, like a bag of spaghetti. They don't condense into anything identifiable where you can visually count them. So um, we don't know the number of chromosomes for a lot of fungi, but I think, if I remember right, it's around 8 to 20 or so. It's not a lot. It's not a big number, but I don't, um, I'd have to check that. It's, it'll be on Wikipedia somewhere. Okay. Um, the number. And then the, for the genome size, the genome sizes are smaller than plants, but they're, um, they're bigger than bacteria genomes, but they're more equivalent to protozoa than to um animals. I think animal genomes might be bigger. I can't remember. But they're definitely, plants have the biggest genomes, partly because plants have a lot of chromosome duplication in their hunt history. Okay, and, and uh, hopefully we follow this here. Do mushrooms ever have extra an extra chromosome? Um, not that I know of, but that, that one case that's parasexual, where they they make a diploid and then um, lose chromosomes through several divisions. So at that, between diploid and haploid stage, they'll have extra chromosomes if they're kind of in the process of getting rid of them. Okay. That's the only one case I know. I don't know of cases where um, you get a recombination, you get extra chromosomes. Usually you'd have, you got usually one set or two sets. Okay. Peter asks again, uh, he says, what characters define mating type and what makes two types compatible? Good question. Yeah, I didn't get into that because that's a whole nother mess. Um, there's lots of variations on that. But the, for our regular mushrooms that we think about, there's basically two. Everything I say has exceptions. This whole talk for fungi, everything, there's exceptions everywhere and variations. But um, basically mushrooms will have um, mating genes that are, there's one set of mating genes or there's two sets of mating genes. And I remember right, those might be on different chromosomes, but I'm not sure. So for a fungus individual to be compatible with another fungus individual, those, those copies of those mating genes have to be different in some way. So the, the base pair sequence has to have a difference that's recognizably different. And that's how the fungus recognizes that the other individual is not related closely to itself because that gene is different. So you can get um, partially compatible where one of the genes is the same and one is different and you get partial mating, but then that mating breaks down and we'll get a, it won't, you know, it won't carry on. But um, what I didn't say also is the, um, the interesting thing I learned about recently was that those hyphae have to fuse before the fungus can figure out it's compatible. So the faithful fuse, the two nuclei come together in that cell. And if it's not mating compatible, that cell with the two nuclei just breaks down. It, it goes into cell death to just kill it off because it's not going <clears> to, <throat> it's not a successful mating. Okay, so those two hyphae, essentially they break apart then, the cell that, that has the fused. Well, the, the hyphae come apart. together, they make a joint cell mm -hmm. where they the contents join together, and that cell that has the two nuclei in it 
um, is attached to the two hyphae that came together, but that, that one cell walls itself off completely. It closes the pores and just dies. It's like over, you know. Okay. Mission aborted, whatever. I see. <laughs> so it's actually kind of confusing. I'm glad the mushrooms can figure it out. Um, if you go back to your chart of uh, showing the ascomycetes and basidiomycetes and, and uh, let's say the, the levels of evolution, um, is there, can you make any sort of generalizations about uh, evolutionary pressure and complexity of mating? Um, I'm sure there's papers on that. There's um, related to that. There's an interesting paper I haven't fully digested. That's called um, um, "Sex Before Sexes." It's looking at all the eukaryotes, all the different kinds of mating systems, and all the eukaryotes, plants, animals, fungi, um, different protozoa and algae, and so forth, slime molds, and each kind of lineage. There's a lot of variation. So there, um, that study figured out that maybe um, sexual cycles started before there, before there were sexes. So sex started with um, haploid individuals, and they went through meiosis, and then they went through periogamy and meiosis of some sort, or whatever, mating and then meiosis. Um, and then along the line, sexes started evolving, but different lineages did their sex differentiation in different ways. Um, but as far as the fungi themselves, if you look at the tree, um, even within the chytrids, but there's different lineages with chytrids. So maybe each lineage of chytrid has the same life cycle, but I'm not sure. But um, there's a lot of variation across the fungi. I don't know. Um, people have sorted out how that all came about. Okay, that's and that kind of leads into my next question: Was is there is there any particular family that uh, that has a more diverse system? Um, uh, is it related to distribution as well? Are those that are more um, able to survive in various habitats have a higher number of mating strategies? Well, um, or reproductive strategies. So some mushroom, a lot of the mushrooms we know, as far as we know. Um, they only go through sexual reproduction and for what we can call fragmentation or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have an asexual stage where they're making spores. Like, so like chanterelles don't make spores as far as we know that are asexual. So to make spores, it has to go through and do sex. But um, the spores germinate and then mate, and then you have a dicarian that lives a long time and that keeps making spores each year. But um, some, some mushrooms... Um, there's odd cases like, um, I don't know if you guys know Tremedes cockifer, the little elm bracket. Um, sure. It's related to turkey tail, but it's kind of white and grows in elm branches. That has little cups on the top of the branch, and inside the cups, it makes asexual spores that splash out with raindrops. So that has an asexual form of reproduction. And there's some other, um, I think it's Calibia, there's some other mushroom types um, and some polypores that have asexual reproduction. So, but that's pretty scattered across the mushroom groups. It's not common. But in the, and then in that inky cap example, that has three different ways of asexual reproduction. So, and morels have various ways. The ascomycetes tend to have a lot more asexual reproduction than um, the ascomycete mushrooms do. So there's a lot of variation in whether a mushroom can do asexual reproduction. And if it can, it can get spread around a lot easier Mm -hmm. um, than going through the whole sexual cycle. That but um, sense. the other thing I didn't mention, which is um, people like, is the schizophilum, the split gill fungus. Tom Volk has a nice webpage on it about explaining how it has 23,000 or 28,000 sexes, if you want to call them sexes. They're different mating types. So it has two sets of mating genes. One set has about 90 different copies, and the other set has, I think, if it was 300 or whatever, if you multiply 90 by 300, you get some big <coughs> number over 20,000 of different mating types it has around the world. So that increases mating to way over 95, 99% um, if it was random. But, you know, each little area of the country might have, they wouldn't have 20,000 mating types, but they'll have a bunch of mating types. So it's more sex 
successful at mating um, when you have a lot of different mating types out there. Huh. Okay. And so if there's, <laughs> that's, it, it's, um, it's very hard to wrap your head around yeah, that. Uh, most um, mushrooms just yeah. have two mating types. They're not, um, as far as we know, as far as I understand it, the ones that we looked at, okay. some have more. So, you know, obviously you teach this to, to students. What is the, um, I guess, what is the most common question that you get from the students? Um, I don't know if there's any common question. Um, I kind of challenge them to think about <coughs> um, how this makes their life different in a way. So fungi live differently than plants and animals. First, they live in, the, in their food. And the reproduction is different. I don't, I don't have not tally up the most common question anymore. Okay. No, but that's that's. Uh, but they do uh, complain about you know too many terms, but you know. <laughs> I think. But I, that's any yeah. new field of knowledge comes with, you know, terminology. Unless you simplify it to the level where it's too ambiguous. So I, I definitely think tonight um, our talk, like I said, we've had a lot of questions that people have brought up uh, over the years that I've been doing this, and uh, nobody can really give that that answer that comes up. And I think a lot of people, what they're going to be doing is going back to this talk and and listening to parts of it and maybe having yeah. to stop. And, and also, um, another good source. Well, you can Google things on online, or I'm sorry, search online, and you know, put in terms like. Um, plasmogamy or um, parasexual or whatever, and you can find papers or pages that explain it. There's quite a number of instructors that have their own websites and um, teaching aids, but Wikipedia has a ton of information on, on fungi and a lot of different aspects of their sex reproduction and all that. Okay. And so as a takeaway to us, because I think uh, that's all the questions that we had, is uh, what is the one thing you want us to take away from this talk? as general or as detailed as you want? Fungi are nowhere like plants and animals. <laughs> um, everything they do is different. Um, they're very simple in the life form. They just have filaments or cells, but um, those threads can make mushrooms and brackets. And But if you tease it apart, it's just made up of threads. It's not a tissue. They don't have tissues. They have fake, um, and it's called pseudoparenchyma. It's false tissues. The hyphae get stuck together and can look like a tissue, but it's just separate threads that are glued together. Um, and then the life cycles are different, especially mushrooms with the dicarion, where they have the, they keep the nuclei separate, and that was, lets them play around with what they do with those nuclei. They're not fixed into a marriage of, of a diploid. Well, okay. Well, we thank no, we thank you, Patrick. This has yep. been great. This challenges us. We always uh, we always love that uh, when we get speakers who can do that for us and bring us into a new realm. And uh, we just again want to thank you for sharing your time with us and sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah, thank you. thanks for inviting me. Oh, happy to, oh, happy fun. to. And uh, for those, um, like I said, this is our last meeting for this year in January. We're going to try to do something a little special. We'll see. And um, unfortunately, we'll just have to, to see where we're at with this COVID thing and uh, how long we end up being online. And slowly, if we can start to come out and uh, do some group meetings, whether it's small groups or something like that. Again, we're, we're all in this. And I, I appreciate your patience at this time. So uh, for OMS, I want to say thank you and good night. And uh, we'll see you in uh, February. Take, Take care. care. Have fun. Okay. Hey.